Great job. I appreciate that. Well, today we get to continue in our series called Follow Me, where we are exploring the lives of Jesus' first disciples. My name is Pastor Phil, and I welcome all of you here. I welcome you uh, who are joining us online as well. We've been stepping into the sandals of these apostles, learning what, who Jesus is from their vantage point and seeing how they've grown and moved forward in their ministries and even covering some of the historical information that we have on, on how they continue to persevere in their faith. Pastor Tim, he's already led us through the exploration of three of the disciples, Peter, Thomas, and Judas Iscariot. And he's identified how Peter's impulsive faith and Thomas's honest doubt, and, and even Judas's tragic betrayal, how they could speak to us today. Pastor Steve Lombardo, he was here this past week preaching on the Apostle John, uh, the, the man who started off as the son of thunder, and he became the Apostle of love. Next week, Pastor Tim will be back in this pulpit He's at Aurora this week, and he's going to be teaching on James, the brother of John. Today, today I have the privilege of, of teaching on maybe a less famous apostle, but definitely not less important, and probably the best-named apostle of all of the apostles, the apostle Philip. We're going to be jumping around to all kinds of different Bible verses so if you're a note taker, get that pen ready. We're going to rock and roll around scriptures. I'll give you some slides so you're able to take some pictures if you need to do that instead of writing it down. But I do want to cover right off the bat that we have four Phillips in the New Testament. And so I want to make sure that we're all talking about the same Philip. We are referring to the Apostle Philip, one of the original 12 disciples of Jesus. He is often confused with the second Philip, Philip the Evangelist, or Philip the Deacon, which is mentioned numerous times in the book of Acts. Specifically, if you look at Acts chapter 8, towards the end of the chapter, you'll see a story about Philip the Evangelist being called out by the Holy Spirit, goes out into the desert and preaches to the Ethiopian eunuch, and he leads him to a saving knowledge in Jesus Christ, and at that moment, he baptizes him. That is not the Philip we are talking about today. There are two other Philips from the Herodian dynasty, both of uh, people who were sons of Herod the Great. One of the Philips is mentioned, the other one is alluded to, mentioned in historical data, but you can see that he's alluded to in these scriptures that are showing up there. The one Herod the Philip or Herod the Tetrarchy, he, he was actually a pretty good leader. He was pretty good. The other Philip, not so good. He actually had a part to do with the beheading of John, John the Baptist. But the, our attention today is going to be on the Apostle Philip. The Apostle Philip. You see, there are 12 apostles and they're broke up into three different sections. Pastor Tim has mentioned this in, in previous messages. I will reiterate it now. The first group is Peter, James, John, and Andrew. That's kind of the inner group, the group that's closest to Jesus. That group is named in a couple different orders. Sometimes it's Peter, James, John, Andrew. Sometimes it's Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Always it's Peter first. Peter's the leader of that group. Peter, Peter's the, the one who leads the whole group of disciples, and he's the leader of the first group. The second group, made up of Philip, Nathaniel, whose also name is Bartholomew, Matthew, and Thomas. That group is mixed up on how they're named throughout the Gospels, with the exception of Philip is always named first in that second group. Philip's always the fifth disciple named which would, uh, we could deduct that he would be the leader of that second group. Our goal today, though, is not to learn from this Philip. Our goal is to learn from the Holy Spirit. We want him to do the teaching, him to do the driving of whatever the message is, 
but our goal is definitely that we are moving forward in our walk with Jesus Christ, or maybe we're coming to know Jesus for the first time today. The entire Bible sermon, the sermon message is follow me, which is exactly where we're going to go right off the bat. Would you join me in praying? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come together. We thank you for the opportunity to learn from you, and we pray that you will guide us, that you will teach us. We pray that all the distractions that we have, maybe the devices we have, all the things, we put them away, that we focus in on what you want us to learn. May you be the great teacher today. We praise you in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. It was back in the summer of 1991. I was getting ready for my junior year of high school. I'm at the neighbor's house, sitting around a kitchen table with a bunch of other guys who graduated a couple years before me. We're enjoying a cheese and sausage tombstone pizza and just having random conversation. Now, I shouldn't remember the conversation at all. I really don't. And I shouldn't remember the night at all, but the fact is, is that my friend, who is going to be a sophomore in high school, her name is Janae, Janae had been at the Family and Youth Bible Camp. That's the camp that we're getting ready for at the end of July. And she had a newfound love for Jesus Christ. This was her home. And when she walked in from coming home from that camp into her kitchen, she just started sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And all the people scattered out of that room as fast as you can see with the exception of me. For whatever reason, that day, I could hear Jesus saying, follow me. You see, all my life, I've known God or trusted that there was God. I never denied that there was a God. I always remember it. I remember playing baseball in the backyard and I'd, I'd be sitting there and I'd be ready to hit and I'd look up and I'd see the sun rays coming through the clouds. I'm like, okay, God, let this one be a home run. You know, I remember truly thinking that that was what I needed to do. I needed to talk to God. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I lived in a little country town called Helmer just outside of Newark and they had a church there. They still do. And every single year they had a two-week vacation Bible school and my mom being the wise mother she was with four boys she sent us to that vacation Bible school <laughs> so I am sure that while I was making those match crosses and that while I was doing all the different crafts and and singing the songs that many times they said hey Philip Jesus loves you hey Philip you want to give your life to Jesus Maybe 47 times I gave my life to Jesus at those vacation Bible schools. I'm not sure. I don't remember. In 1991, before this moment in time, I was attending a, a youth group in our area led by Pastor Steve Larson. Him and his wife, Chris, they'd welcome us into their house and destroy their house every single Sunday night. And I'm sure Pastor Steve, that he was frequently saying, it's time to love Jesus. It's time to, to throw all these things away and, and focus in on Jesus. It's time to, to commit your life to Jesus. I didn't hear any of that. You see, I was so worried about getting back outside and showing off for the girls in the sports that we were playing. But for whatever reason, this moment in time, from this sophomore girl's testimony, I heard Jesus say, follow me. And I dropped everything, and I followed Jesus. Amen. My testimony reminds me of a much, much older Philip, the Apostle Philip, the fifth disciple of Jesus. He has a testimony very similar to that situation. And that's going to lead us into our first point. The Apostle Philip, he was a seeker. He was a seeker, not just any kind of seeker. He was a truth seeker. He wanted to know the truth of what was happening. And so we're going to get a quick glimpse into the testimony of this fifth disciple. It's at the end of John chapter 1, verses 43 through 44. And I believe we even have a slide for you. The next day, 
The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. You see, Janae's words incited me to commit my life to follow Jesus. And these words right here that Jesus spoke, follow me, incited Philip to drop everything and to follow him because he immediately recognized that this was the Messiah. He, he, he had been studying and understanding that there was a Messiah coming. We'll get to that in the next point. But he wasn't just wanting any person to walk up to him. He knew the truth. And, and Philip's journey, had, he had no idea what this journey was going to be about. If you remember when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you had no idea what that journey was going to be about. But you took the step of faith and it, and it, it, it took this. One step. One first step to start making a difference by saying, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to follow him. And all of our journeys, we don't know what's going to happen, but we can trust that we're within the sovereignty of God because we're following Jesus. We're following Jesus. There may be a lot of bad things happen. There may be a lot of weird things happen. There may be a lot of tears shed. But when you walk behind Jesus and you follow him, that's the place you want to be. When we start seeking Jesus, we start to get to know who we really are. We start to understand what our purpose is. But there's a warning, friends. There's a warning. You see, in this world today, we are seekers, but sometimes we're seeking information in all the wrong places. We're Googling it. We're going to YouTube and, and asking the questions. We're asking random friends at, at school about the truth and about what this is. We're watching somebody on TikTok. We're gaining information from, from news radio places, and, and we're just we're pulling all this information. That becomes our truth. Instead, I can, I can challenge you guys, and I want to challenge you guys, that the truth comes through the 66 books of the Bible. And if it's against the 66 books of the Bible, it's not the truth. It needs to be filtered through that. And that's what a truth seeker does. I put together a slide for you. You can take a picture of it. It's going to last a lot longer that way, of, of maybe how you can live a life of seeking truth. These are some different verses you can look up later. But I do want to tell you that Jesus said in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Do you understand this, friends, that the truth is Jesus? This is an exclusionary statement. I, I trusted God, but I didn't know who Jesus was. I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. You need to know Jesus, friends. That's where the seeking needs to happen. The apostle Philip heard Jesus say, follow me, and he knew it was coming from the truth, the Messiah. Our second characteristic not only was Philip a truth seeker, but Philip was a servant. Philip was a servant. John chapter 1, just the next verse, verses 45 and 46, this is what it says. Philip found Nathanael. Remember, Nathanael is also Bartholomew. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote. Remember, he's, a, he, he, he's, he's pointing back to there's a knowledge that he has, that he's been going in the synagogue, he's been studying, he's been learning, he knows the scriptures. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, Nathanael said to him, can, can anything good come out, come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Come and see. Philip's first instinct was after meeting Jesus, was to share it, was to give it away, what was to multiply it. Is that what we're doing? 
Are you sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with the team that you're on? With your coworkers? How about with your children? Some of you are older here and your children aren't walking with the Lord. Are you, are you continuously on an ongoing basis in a, in a responsible way, in a mature way, sharing the love of Jesus you have for them without exasperating? How about that guy at the gas station that you always get coffee at? What's his name? Joe? Philip knew what he knew, and he knew that he was now a follower of the Messiah, a follower of the King of Kings, a follower of the Christ, the Anointed One, and he wanted to share that with everybody around him. I could tell you a whole story why I think Philip was a fisherman as well, and why he was friends with Andrew and, and Peter. We're not going to go into those details, but I could picture Philip there working on his net, and, and he's, he's, he's sitting there, and he's talking, hey, Ralph, <laughs> that was a great thing that we saw last night, wasn't it, bud? And, and they're just talking, random talk, and, and all of a sudden, he sees this group of guys come and walk, and, and he's like, oh, hey, Andrew, hey, Peter, what's going on, guys? And they don't even answer him, and Jesus turns, and he looks at him right in his eyes, and he says, follow me. And that moment in time, Philip knew that this was the Messiah. And he dropped his net and said, Ralph, talk to you later. And he walked off. And then while he was walking off, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit, just moments after that, it's like, you gotta, you gotta share this. He's like, I, I don't know who to share this with. <gasps> Nathaniel, my buddy Th Nathaniel, he needs to know this. And so he went right away and, and, and got Nathaniel. As servants of Jesus, we need to be just sharing the good news with tons of people. There's a guy here at our, at our church, good buddy of mine. We've been really doing some ministry together, talking and, and strategizing on, on how we're loving people and how we're loving our family, how we're loving and making connections with other people, what we're doing. And one of the conversations we continuously have is, is how are we sharing the good news with other people? not just the people that are sitting here at church or new here at church, but people that we come in contact with. How are we interacting with them and what are we doing? He wrote a, a large testimony of his, of his own and he wrote a shorter testimony uh, that he can give to, to start the process. But he went back to his house and, and he pulled out uh, Google Sheets and he made a, a spreadsheet of all the people that he's sharing the gospel with currently today. And it got to 17 people that he's currently actively working on sharing the good news with. And, and, and you know what? He comes across a whole bunch of people that, that actually get frustrated, have skepticism. But he doesn't say anything. He just welcomes their questions. And he says, come and see Here's my testimony. Come and see all that Jesus has. You see, it's just like Philip had a servant's heart. That's what we're to have. Our faith is not for us to hang on to ourselves. Our faith is to hand it out freely to everybody we come in contact with. We also see that Philip had a servant's heart in John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verses 20 through 22. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Now we don't know officially why they approached Philip. Perhaps Philip, uh, it was because Philip is the only one with a Greek name. Philip is a Greek name meaning lover of horses. And, and perhaps that's why. We never know his Hebrew name. Maybe it was because he was approachable. Maybe it was because he had the reputation that if we talk to Philip, he's going to get us in. He's going to hook us up. You know, it's like that, like, like the, the people who want to, uh, maybe you're at college and, and you're in sports and you want to play, you want to be able to shoot hoops anytime you want. Who do you make friends with? The custodian. He's got the keys. Hey, bud, hey, can I get in the gym? Oh, yeah, you bet, Phil. Maybe Philip was that guy. 
that they knew that they can get to Jesus. You see, Philip was always connecting people to Jesus. That was one of his roles. He was a conduit, a bridge to the Messiah. And you know what, friends? We're called to imitate that same act. Wouldn't that be great if people thought that you were the connection to Jesus? We have some, we have some extended family that sometimes will, will shoot us a text or give us a call and say, hey, we know you're close with God. Would you pray about this? You see, we, we want to be connectors. Hey, you know what? Why don't you come and see all that Jesus has to offer? We have to get out of our comfort zones, though, friends. Too many of us are sitting in our comfort zones and we're not serving God in real ways. We're just going through the motions. We're too focused on whatever we're focused on. We have to stop doing the normal stuff in our lives and start doing the extraordinary stuff that we can't get credit for because Jesus is the one who has to get the credit because of what's happening. Don't you want to be part of that? Each of our acts of service, no matter how big or how small, are huge in the kingdom of God. Each listening ear, each invitation, those are huge. There, there's a story, 1996, I was getting my undergrad at Northern Illinois University, and it was between classes, and I went to McDonald's. I think I have a picture of it, and it looked very similar to this in DeKalb. There was an outdoor playground. I was in my burgundy Chevy Lumina that the driver's door didn't open. And I was in that Lumina enjoying a 10-piece nugget with large fries and an ice-cold Coca-Cola, listening to the radio. When I look in the mirror and I see in the playground these guys holding skateboards, long hair, black clothes, and instantly I could, I could hear the Holy Spirit, not audibly, but I knew it, Go give them a Bible. Go give them a Bible. I had attended Promise Keepers. Some of you remember Promise Keepers. And, and I, as we were walking out of Soldier Field, they gave us a stack of New Testaments, as many as we wanted to take, as long as we were going to give them out to other people. So I grabbed one of those New Testaments. I think it had red or orange on the cover. And I walked over there, and I reached through that fence. You could see the fence on there. And I, I reached through the fence... Hey, guys, God wanted me to give you this Bible. Well, they just laughed it off. Okay, that was strange. I walked back to my car holding the Bible and reached in my window to open my door. I tossed the New Testament in my passenger seat, and, and then I just sit there and I think, why? Why did you have me do this? Was it like a test? Did you want me to, to just like, are you going to go through with it? Whatever. I just continued to eat my nuggets. But then I saw them coming out at the door. And they started making their way towards my Lumina. Oh boy. What were they going to do? One by one, they passed on my passenger side, and they didn't, they didn't touch my car. I thought they may smash it or something. I don't even know why, but... The last guy passed my window. He went all the way to the front of the car, and then he stopped. And he backpedaled a little bit, and he crouched down in my window, and he said, Sir, can I have that book? I said, you betcha. You betcha. I don't know what happened to that kid. I don't know what happened to those, those boys. But I do know that I was being a servant there. It had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with me willing to let the Holy Spirit guide me, looking for opportunities. We've seen Philip, the Apostle Philip, as a seeker of truth. We've seen Philip as a servant of Christ. Our third point, let's explore Philip as a student. 
as a student. There's a remarkable story in John chapter 6 about the feeding of 5,000, how Jesus feeds 5,000. But most scholars would say there was probably 15 to 20,000 people. The 5,000 were only the adult men, not counting the women and children. And I could see all these people gathering together, and I, and I picture this scene. Here's Philip. Philip is there, and he's like, okay, let's just for, for, sh, 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 sh. carry the one. Uh, sh, sh, sh. Oh, my goodness. Hey, Judas, how much money do we have? 200 denarii? Oh, my goodness gracious. You see, Jesus knew what Philip was thinking. He knew everything that was being thought about right then. And so Jesus comes over to Philip. This is in John 6, 5 through 7. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would, would not be enough for each of them to get a little. At this point, chronologically speaking, Philip had already witnessed numerous miracles, numerous things that were impossible that Jesus made possible. He had seen water turn to wine. He had seen a boy healed, a, a man healed at the pool. He had seen demon-possessed people cleansed. He had seen multiple miracles, and yet he resorted right back to his human nature, his human practicality, and he said, Whew, this is a tough one. I don't know how we're going to feed them. He forgot about the divine power of Jesus. He forgot. But he was willing to be a student as that time went on and as he watched it. We see also in John chapter 14, verses 8 and 9. This is during the Last Supper. Philip again appears as a role of his student. He says, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. To this, Jesus responds, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Philip's still learning. He's been with Jesus for multiple years. And he's still learning. He's still gaining understanding. I mean, Jesus consistently taught that him and the Father were one. Simply put, in John 10, 30, he said, I and the Father are one. I'm sure Philip was there. He also said in John 8, 58, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Connecting him with the Old Testament, saying that he was God. It was very clear that Jesus was teaching of his divine identity throughout all of his teaching. Yet these disciples, Philip, probably the other disciples as well, couldn't put that together. They couldn't figure that out. Their journey was, was continually learning. And that's, that's exactly what we should be doing as well. It shows us that, that, you know what, it takes time. You don't know all the answers right away, and that's okay. Hopefully when you're 83 years old, you still don't have all the answers, because if you think you do, you're wrong. We need to keep learning, keep growing, keep moving forward, keep maturing. And, and Philip, in both of these times, he took the posture of a student. He didn't take the posture of someone who was arguing. He, oh, he got something wrong. Okay, let's, let me argue this, why I think I'm right. No, no, he just did it. He took the posture of someone who wanted to learn, and he started learning. He took the posture of the student, which is exactly what we should adopt. We need to adopt the posture of being students on an ongoing basis. We need to embrace these times where, where we just have really uh, crazy uncertainty, that we don't know what's going on. I don't know why this is happening, but I need to trust in God. You see, we, we have the revelation of, of God through, through the scriptures. We have way more information than Philip had. And yet, over and over and over and over, we start thinking like, like humans. Like we have no clue. Oh, I, 
I have no idea how we're going to do this. I have no idea. Good. That's where we're supposed to get to. Because then it's God's glory. It's not ours. I, I like to work. And I could work hard. I could spend many hours doing stuff and, and striving towards things. But I don't need a pat on the back in the end. When you're a humble leader, you start realizing that it, it doesn't matter. You start getting old enough, enough grandchildren, you start figuring out it doesn't matter. It's all about Jesus in the end. It's all about Jesus. We need to be students. And it's not just for our sake. We don't want to learn just to learn. You can learn all of Scripture and have no clue. You could be the smartest person in this room and you could be going to hell. Because that knowledge doesn't matter. Becoming wise by learning and following Jesus is where we need to be. That's where we need to get to. We must continue to seek this out so we can keep sharing it on. So how can we apply this? How can we apply these teachings? We still have six points to go. How are we going to get through this? I'll tell you what, friends. These six key points that we're going to close with, I want to give you a, a little bit of a statement right off the bat. These six points are only for people who follow the king. They're only for people who love Jesus Christ. They're only for people who accept John 14, 6, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That's what these six points are, these, these principles maybe to live by. They're not for you. If you do not trust in Jesus Christ, they're not for you. Because maybe you believe in God. Maybe you're just like I was. Well, I, come on, pastor, I, I believe in God. I believe in God, come on. But you don't know Jesus. These six points are for followers of Jesus, just like our communion will be. Our communion is only going to be for people who trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It, it's a sacred moment to reflect on what Jesus has done for us. So if you don't believe in Jesus, this isn't for you. If you don't believe in Jesus, do I have your attention yet? Because I want to invite you to come and see. I want to invite you to come and see. I want to let you know that Jesus loves you deeply. That Jesus knows your every action, your every thought, your every flaw. He knows your flaws and he knows my flaws. And yet, and yet he loves us. Yet he cares about us. You see, Jesus offers his unfathomable grace and forgiveness to each of us. Jesus went to the cross for the forgiveness of sins for the apostle Philip so he could be forgiven. He went to the cross for the preacher that's standing right here so that I could be forgiven. And he went to the cross for you and for you. And for you at home, he went to the cross for you. Six application points are going to come at you fast. After these points, we're going to go right into communion. The first one, pursue understanding. Pursue understanding. Like Philip, let's seek to go deeper into God's word. Desiring to understand his truth and his promises, let's invest time in studying in God's word. And you know what, friends? Take your phones and chuck them against the walls. Because I'll tell you what, if you're like me, 90 plus percent of the time I'm using a device when I'm reading scripture. And that's unfortunate because then you get the alert, the text, you get the like on that Instagram that was posted in 2021. I get the YouTube link that something big has happened at Legoland. 
and all of a sudden I, whoa, hey, squirrel. We have to pursue an understanding of God through scripture. We have to get on our knees. Ask yourself this, I'm gonna ask it out loud and then you ask yourself and you be true to yourself. When was the last time you literally were on your knees talking to God Almighty? If it's been a long time, you're not pursuing an understanding from God. Now there's many ways to pray and I'm not saying that that's the only way to pray, but I'm saying there is something fundamental about that. You're getting in a posture ready to understand, ready to dig into God's word, ready to hear from him. When you start gathering this understanding, then we can honor Jesus. We can honor Jesus. As Philip honored Jesus by answering this call without hesitation, that's our second point. May we too recognize and honor Jesus in our lives. May we honor Jesus with our thoughts. Maybe most of the time today you've been writing down your list of to-do stuff for after the service. Maybe it's a grocery list. Don't forget to get those, uh, that bread and, and peanut butter and don't forget to get this and that. And you're thinking, oh, I gotta remember this because your thoughts are all over the place. Stop. Honor Jesus by, by saying, I need you to help me with my thoughts. I need to stop thinking about that other person other than my spouse. I need to stop doing that thing. How about your words? I need to honor Jesus with my words. I shouldn't be saying those things to my kids. I shouldn't be saying that to my spouse. I shouldn't be saying those things to the coworkers. I shouldn't be saying those things as I'm driving to Chicago. How are you speaking? Oh yeah, here at church, you're speaking great. Hey, hey, how you doing? What's going on? But what was the speech like on the way here? On the way home? We need to honor Jesus. And as we honor Jesus, we should introduce others. Introduce others. Philip's immediate reaction to meeting Jesus was to introduce Jesus to other people. Right away. We need to follow this example. Who are you talking to about Jesus right now? That's where you get your pen out and you start making that list. Who is it that I'm talking to? Maybe it's that kid at your school that, that keeps frustrating you and you're honoring Jesus and all that you can and now you're going to start having that conversation. The beauty is, guys, when you start, you start honoring Jesus and you start introducing people, you can just kind of get out of the way and say, come and see and let them do the work. Well, how do we find these other people? We should be listening to the Spirit. Listen to the Spirit. Philip listened to the Spirit's prompting as he went and told Nathaniel, you got to see this. The Messiah is here. He was sensitive to the Spirit. Are you being sensitive to the Spirit? Are you listening to the Spirit driving you in different places? That's part of getting down on your knees, friends. Asking the Spirit, man, please guide me to that place. I am tired of doing the same thing over and over and over and over. I want to listen to you. I want to follow you, God. Help me pass this on to other people as well. Maybe it's your own children or grandchildren, friends, co-workers, people at, 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 that, at your kids' sports. Ah, no, we just go to the sports and, and watch, watch our kid. We don't want to be weird, those weird people. Look for those opportunities. I met a random guy at Menards the other day and I was sharing with him the love of Jesus and found out it was my friend Chris Branning's dad. I had no idea. I was just listening and waiting for an opportunity that the Holy Spirit was going to lead me to somebody. And when we do that, we need to invite questions invite questions. Philip welcomed inquiries about Jesus. He served as that bridge and he was patient. 
He wanted to help people encounter Jesus. May we be open and patient. You know what gets tiring? I have a couple kids. Sometimes it gets tiring when they say, oh, hey, hey, Dad, I got a question. Hey, Dad, I got a question. Hey, Dad, I got a question. Invite those questions over and over and over. I had a tough, tough story to even admit. I was driving to Sugar Grove a couple months ago. I was coming to a funeral. And I love listening to sermons on the radio. I, I do. I, I love, I, I'll, I'll listen through my phone if, if there's not one on Moody. But I love listening to them. I'm, I'm picking up like the last five minutes of this sermon. And all of a sudden I'm into it. I don't even know what he's talking about yet. But I'm focused in on it. And so I don't want any questions coming from that passenger seat of my 11-year-old son. Hate to admit that. But I get, I get in that zone, I'm start, I want to listen to what this is. But for whatever reason, on our way to the funeral, the Holy Spirit said, turn the radio off and let's welcome some questions. And my 11-year-old son just started asking me all kinds of questions about the funeral. And then he, then he asked me the question, hey, Dad, how do I get to heaven? And then within the 22 lights that we drove here, it takes 22 lights to my house. We live literally on 47, same side of the street, 22 lights away south. My son asked the question, hey dad, can I give my life to Jesus Christ? Yeah. Yes, you can. And he gave his life to Jesus Christ right then. You see, friends, it had nothing to do with me. If it was up to me, I wouldn't have welcomed those questions. I wanted to listen to the random preacher that I don't even remember who it was or what he was talking about. But yet this was his moment of time where he heard Jesus say, follow me, and he dropped everything at that moment in time and he followed Jesus because we invited questions. Stop getting tired of those questions, friends. When they keep asking questions over and over, bring them on bring them on. And brothers and sisters, in the end, let's persevere in our faith. Let's persevere. Philip persevered in spite of making some mistakes, in spite of making some weird things happen, in spite of all the things that he did or didn't do. He continued to persevere. He continued to move forward in his journey. And he suffered the ultimate sacrifice of, of being martyred. That's what tradition tells us. We don't know exactly how. They could conflict. We're not going to get there. But, but his focus was on the eternal prize that he had at the end. He persevered. So we want the Apostle Philip's life to be an inspiration to each of us. As we go out from here, that we're pursuing an understanding, that we're honoring Jesus, that we're introducing others to him, that we're listening to the Spirit, that we're inviting questions, and that we persevere in our faith. Amen? Amen. So as we pivot to a time of communion, I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward. They've got little communion cups if you're a follower of Jesus Christ for 32 years or 32 seconds, I'm going to invite you to take communion today. This is for people who love Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. This little cup has, has bread on top and juice on the bottom. If you're at home and you're getting ready for communion, grab whatever you can and, and join with us in this process. Raise your hand if you need communion and, and they're going to be giving it to you. Don't be shy about it. Be confident. You see, when I was studying the Apostle Philip, I had the opportunity to really, really reflect on all that was happening in Philip's life. And I was really struck by the Last Supper. You see, at the Last Supper, there were 13 men there. There were 13 people in that room. 
and, and usually a servant would be there to clean the feet and wash the legs a little bit where the dirt had come up on. And, and there was no servant there, so it would fall to the, to the bottom man of the totem pole. But Jesus, the top man on the totem pole, became a humble leader and grabbed the water and, and, and the towel and, and he started cleaning each of their feet. Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas, James the Lesser, Simon and Thaddeus. But you know what? He also, while he was washing their feet, at some point in there, he got Judas Iscariot. And I bet he really got between the toes of Judas, cleaned it real good, because that's who Jesus is. And he cleaned all of their feet, and then he sat back down. And he was getting ready to enjoy a great supper with his fellow brothers, in that room, though, was still Judas Iscariot, somebody who wasn't a follower of Jesus. You know what Jesus did? He excused Judas. He excused Judas, let him leave before he instituted communion. It was in there that he could only institute communion because it's for true followers of Jesus Christ. Communion is about remembering who Jesus is and what he did for us, that he gave of his body, that he shed of his blood for our forgiveness. That's what communion is. And I don't want to rush it, friends. I don't want to rush this time. I want to, I want to sit here for a moment and reflect on what's going on in our life. What are you really doing to honor Jesus today? How are you a humble servant? So we're going to take a few moments here. We're going to pray on our own. If you have a kid in here with you, put your arm around that kid and you pray with that kid. You make sure that, that you are focused in on Jesus and on who he is, not who you are. Forget about any of the troubles you think you have. We serve an eternal God and a sovereign God.